on the last day, you just get everything right. And then it's over. <laughs> it's not the last day, it's the last evening session for now. <laughs> So a very warm welcome back. And I, I do think we need a very warm welcome in this part of uh, the world. And I hope you've had a nice afternoon in whatever way that may have been for you. And that you're content with however many moments of peace you experienced. The more contented we are with these things, the more we enjoy and appreciate them. So the less we actually need. So I've not started yet. We'll just wait uh, another few seconds. I do like flicking through the screens just to see people's face and feel that we're together here. <laughs> see Leela smiling. Hi. <laughs> Hi. There's been some lovely positive notes of appreciation and general positive uh, friendly energy in this group. It's just been such a pleasure to, to be here with you all. Sort of a shame that we can't meet in person yet. Ajahn Brahm always sticks that word yet onto everything, especially for people who say, oh, you know, I can't get into samadhi yet. It's very important. <laughs> okay, so we'll begin because uh, today, as I said, is the last uh, of my evening sessions and we've been covering various themes in those sessions. The first day we covered the theme of loving kindness. I shouldn't really say covered, but we touched upon it. Uh, the second day we touched upon trust and then it, there was joy and letting go and today is contentment which is another beautiful way of making peace, of letting go, of overcoming the hindrances to meditation. And contentment is particularly powerful I find in, in the sense that it really helps overcome all the Ajahn Brown says you can think of contentment as the middle way not the literal middle way that the Buddha taught, but the middle way between craving and ill will. So it's this kind of middle place that isn't moved by those winds of desire and ill will. And it's a very pleasant antidote to those hindrances because it has this beautiful emotional warmth to it. And uh, it's the opposite of restlessness as well. Contentment is something that helps us sink into the moment and go deeply inside. Whereas restlessness is like a wind that's constantly blowing us away from this moment so that we only ever skim the surface. We never really sink into anything deeply or long, in, long, long enough to see the truth. I was gonna say longly enough. <laughs> So in the Pali language, contentment is uh, known as santuti. It's a very sweet word, santuti. And you may know that word from the santusika realms or um, in Tibetan Buddhism, in the Mahayana, the Sanskrit word, santushi, santusita or santushita, I think. And so these are the realms of contented beings who are very happy with what they have and feel, of course, very rich and very full. So we can enter those realms, metaphorically speaking, by developing contentment in our minds. And the synonyms for contentment are words like satisfaction or ease, of course, peace, um, a sense of good enough. But the good enough isn't a sort of bland sense of, well, this will do. It's something very rich and very full. As I said, it sort of differs from emotions like acceptance and equanimity, to me anyway, in that it has a certain warmth to it. It has a warm emotional tone so that where acceptance simply um, can stay with something 
and equanimity can look upon without reacting with craving and ill will, contentment really values and appreciates whatever it's experiencing. It really savors the experience and as such can sink more deeply in. And I was just having a nice meditation this afternoon. I shouldn't really use the word nice. It's just a meditation. But the characteristic of it for me was one of contentment because I was sort of very comfortable and just very relaxed without any sort of idea of moving on to something or anything that I wanted to attain. It was really just to have a rest for the mind. And um, at the beginning of my Reigns retreat this year, actually, it was a three month retreat in solitude. And Ajahn Brahm said, be very careful not to blow it by getting hopes, you know, for things like jhanas and enlightenment. He said, make contentment the goal. And that way you'll be on vacation. It'll be a real retreat. Because the minute that these wantings and cravings come in, we're no longer on holiday. We're no longer free. You know, there's an agenda there. There's something we can either succeed in or, or fail in. And straight away, you're setting yourself up for, um, for suffering, you know, for suffering and desire. Right? Desire is the cause of that suffering. And so when we're contented, we're undermining the root cause of suffering one of the root causes because delusion is at the root of it all. So I would like to say that contentment is different from being passive or complacent and it's certainly very different from being complicit you know with abuse or with uh, racism or any kind of um, maybe misogyny or marginalization, marginalization of vulnerable groups. So we should always speak out you know and, and not stop speaking out as long as we see wrongdoing, especially people, for example, breaking their precepts and harming others. But contentment and all these positive emotions can actually give us the resilience and the strength to do that. Because instead of moving into despair and frustration and anger towards the perceived perpetrator of wrong, it actually helps resource the mind. And again, focus more on what we're putting in, where we're coming from, than outcomes. So even though we're not successful, we can be contented that we tried. And that contentment will give us the strength to try again, to try again. But contentment is very different from fault finding at the same time. And it's an antidote to what Ajahn Brahm calls the fault finding mind. You know, in a way, contentment carries this beautiful quality of forgiveness because it can forgive the imperfections of life. We can forgive the imperfections in ourselves or in others, in our partners, in our homes, in society, in the government, however you perceive it. And, you know, if things had to be perfect for us to find some peace, we would really be stuffed. Because the very nature of samsara is that there is always going to be dissatisfaction. There's always going to be suffering or at least an irritation and agitation on the stillness of the mind. Yeah, so we can't find a perfect place, but we can learn to be content in the here and now. And the Buddha called contentment the greatest wealth, probably for that reason, because, you know, if we can actually really appreciate and enjoy what we have, then we do feel rich. We do feel we have enough. And in the gradual training, the Buddha um, talks about contentment as one of the qualities um, of a monastic in particular. And uh, he says, you know, just as a monastic is content with robe and bowl, they become like a bird that wherever it flies, it takes its wings as its only burden. It's free, it's light, it can soar. Yeah, so contentment is a part of that gradual training. And for years before I ordained, I was living a very um, simple and fairly renounced life. Living in India, I had about 20 pounds a week on a traveler's check that I'd have to cash in at some local bank and stand in line for two hours <laughs> in those days. This was the early 90s. And, um, and I was just so free. And I started to meditate when I was 20. That was in 96 in India. And, uh, and my whole life was just about making it from one meditation center to the next somehow. It didn't really matter, you know, whether I'd travel third class or whether I'd even have to, I don't know, spend days and days in a train. I was just concerned with, you know, practicing the Dhamma and I felt so free that I had all my life ahead of me for that purpose. 
and just carrying a very small backpack, usually with secondhand t-shirts that other people had given me. And then I'd give those away and I'd get another one just at the right time. And it was really serendipitous, you know, it felt like everything I needed would just come to me at the right time. And I felt very strongly this was because I was on the right path and I was putting my energy into something so worthwhile and also giving a lot of service at that time. And I remember another experience um, just to indicate, you know, how easy it can be to be contented with little. When I was um, trekking in Ladakh and I was in 96 and I just went up there for about six weeks before you had to get some kind of tourist guide. And I just went with a little backpack and a couple of people I'd met along the way who carried a kerosene stove. But unfortunately, the kerosene leaked all over the few little provisions we had. We had some like fairly posh dried apricots. This was the best thing we could afford. Like apricots are abundant over there. And in Ladakh, all the valleys are at different angles and different altitudes. So when the apricots in one valley have finished, there'll be new apricots in another of a different variety. So we had these beautiful dried apricots to go in our porridge in the mornings. But unfortunately, the kerosene from the stove spilled and soaked them completely. So we didn't have that anymore. And I remember this one morning trying to light the stove and it took about, oh, probably almost an hour to get it lit so that we could actually get this porridge to boiling point, which it barely reached because of the altitude. And we had hardly anything left. And that evening we camped in this uh, valley just below a very high pass. And, um, and we went to a village house and we said, we have no food. I'm not sure, it would have been sign language because certainly we didn't speak the language and there were like 15 houses in this village. And, uh, and they got us to sit down and made us this meal. And it was, it was rice, potatoes, some turmeric and some salt. And I swear it was the most delicious meal. This is why I can remember it and talk about it here because it was the most delicious meal. One of them that I can ever remember having. It, we just wolfed it down and I think they gave us each two huge plates. And you know, this was just an example of feeling so content and so easily satisfied because you really valued whatever you had. You know, you didn't expect it either. You know, there's this aspect of contentment, which is um, very humble. It's not demanding, it doesn't expect. And so when you don't expect, your goals are, are small, your expectations are small. You don't demand so much of others or of your meditation or your practice, right? So it's a very beautiful, humble state of mind. And as I said, my advice from Ajahn Brahm this reigns was to make not jhanas my goal, not enlightenment my goal, but make contentment my goal. So I did become very content in my own company and I had a wonderful time. So how can it help us in meditation just quickly before we do some meditation? The first thing of course is that goal. Contentment creates a very different goal. If the goal is to be content, you're actually choosing a goal that goes away from craving, that goes in the opposite direction into where you are right now. And uh, one of Ajahn Brahm's quotes that I really love is to be more fully where you already are. And so you can see how this kind of beautiful little catchphrase really helps with present moment awareness. It's not talking about where you are, where you should be, or even what kind of experience you might be having, but just be more fully with wherever you are, where you already are. So whatever's arising, whether it's body sensations, whether it's the breath, whether it's fantasies or even memories full of anger, whatever it is, be more fully where you already are and be there with that contentment, which is soft and forgiving, yeah? And which can really settle and slow down. That was another experience I had this afternoon, actually, when I was contemplating this. I realized after my meditation that my mind had become very slow. And because of that slowness, again, you can drink in the experience much more fully than when we're just rushing on to this and that. It's like most of our life, we're just skimming the surface. You know, like Ajahn Brahm's simile of, stand, of walking up the hill instead of going up in a speeding car. We're rushing so much, we just sort of, okay, this object, that object, and on to the next thing. But when we can just be, and that hour, I only sat for an hour this afternoon, but it really went so fast. And at the end, I was like, oh, I wish I had longer. And then it's like, no, contentment with little. 
you know, and just again, inclining the mind back to that contentment, being satisfied, being appreciative of what I had, really energized and, and sort of buoyed up the mind. So the mind becomes soft and because the mind's soft, the breath can soak into the mind, it can absorb into the mind. It's not like this very hard mind that the breath is kind of bouncing off, you know, it wants to come in, but we don't want it or we're not ready for it. A content of mind is soft, it's receptive, it's forgiving, as I said, even if that breath feels coarse, even if you don't think that breath is the way it should be, it's your breath. You know, it's it's your humble moment. It's what you have right now. So can we just allow ourselves to open to that? And of course, as the hindrances start to lessen with the practice of any of these beautiful, um, skillful means, the Buddha says that when the the mind is free from hindrances, it is soft. He says it's like you've purified gold that was full of impurities. So there's this beautiful sutta and it likens um, gold with impurities like tin, copper, lead or whatever to the mind with hindrances. And this is gold that's very um, hard and you can't get through to it. It's, you know, it's uh, basically you can't do very much with it. And then he says that you melt it down, you melt it down. And gradually those um, impurities leave the gold and it becomes like molten. And he says that this is like the mind when it's free from hindrances, and especially after the jhana states, after the deep meditations, it becomes soft, malleable, fit for work, and very important, unbiased. And so the simile is that you can then create anything you want to out of this gold. If you want to make a jog or if you want to make jewellery, you can make it. In the same way, this soft, malleable mind, you can put it in any direction. You can put it to work, whether you want to start uncovering truths of non-self or you want to go back to past lives. You know, there are ways to do this with a soft mind, which is receptive, which is malleable and you know free from wants and desires so this of course is a deeper level of meditation but another point i just wanted to make about contentment is that um it takes us in a different direction restlessness craving ill will they take us out they take us out into the sense objects they take us off the moment onto something else whereas contentment is like we're coming inward we're coming into what's already there Another really beautiful um, teaching from Ajahn Brown that came up in my mind spontaneously on retreat was don't look for what's not there, look for what is there. You know, it's really amazing how you can hear these teachings and I've heard thousands put, well, hundreds definitely of his talks, maybe I've heard them so often that it is thousands. Uh, but sometimes these little key teachings will just arise in the mind. Don't look for what's not there, look for what is there. And it changes the direction around. Can you see how that starts to take you inward? And a simile that came up in my mind during my reigns was that, um, you know, there's this uh, sort of simile in the suttas about the river that you have to cross. And it, you can imagine it like a really, really wide river. And we have to have a boat to cross it onto the other shore. Yeah, to get enlightened. So we have to cross this river of samsara and all dangers and pitfalls to get to the other side. But what I noticed is when the mind is content, it's as though that river starts to narrow. Because you're going inward, you're not thinking about going over to the other side, you're actually where you are already and you start going inward and you start to feel like the gap between where you are now and peace on the other side is getting smaller and smaller and the peace is starting to arise where you are. And in the same way, when the mind would start leaning forward, even a little bit, just leaning on to what might happen next, it's as though that river widens again. It becomes wider because I'm further away from that piece. So it's not only about sort of how fast we row or what kind of boat we have. Sometimes it's just about going inward and you find a different way through. In one of the suttas, the Buddha calls the jhanas like the escape tunnels from samsara. It's like you find a crack or you find a tunnel on the ground and you go a different direction. So 
<laughs> unfortunately I've already talked for longer than I um, am supposed to and this is the Q&A session so this is enough on contentment for now and I'll try to evoke some of those ideas and feelings and tones of that quality during our meditation so if you would like to prepare yourself to sit or to lie down however you feel you'll be most comfortable and contented. Make sure you're contented with your cushion, with your clothing. My robe is not quite right, so I'm gonna do something initially so that I can then be content. We do what we can to fix the faults, but then we leave it alone. <clears throat> so as usual with these meditations, whatever I offer is just a suggestion. You don't have to take that up. It's an invitation if it helps you. Another tool for the box. So, as we've been practicing on this retreat, we're going to start with a little body scan. See where your mind wants to begin, perhaps at the tips of the toes, or maybe at the top of the head. And establishing the, atten the intention to be aware and to be kind. As though your mindfulness is illuminating those areas that need your kindness and care. So just gently, naturally, at your own speed, spreading kindfulness as though suffusing your entire body with the golden rays of the sun. You might imagine the deep orange gold of a sunset or the cool, pale, golden light of the winter sun. Imagine that drenching, soaking through, and suffusing each and every cell in your body with kindfulness, the warmth and the light of the sun. And just as the sun shines impartially on everything it meets, this kindfulness is unconditional, without any agenda, without even hoping for the pain, tension or tightness to go away. without even imagining it to be different. Just opening, embracing exactly how you are.
forgiving the imperfections of your body, the imperfections of this moment and of your mind. arisen from causes and in that sense exactly the way it has to be. Noticing any response in the body as you soak it through with this golden light. Perhaps a softening, a tingling. Perhaps even delight. Just noticing what's there, however that manifests to you. Regarding every experience with kindly eyes. If you wish to continue just making peace, suffusing your body and mind with kindfulness, please do. Otherwise, you're invited to join in a little imagination exercise. Imagining or remembering a time that you were really content. A humble, simple moment where there were no demands on you. Nothing to do or to fix. No sense of something to attain, to get to or to be. Just like a child on a lazy, sunny afternoon, playing by the river. Completely free. See if any image or felt sense of that contentment arises for you. Notice how that feels. Taking your time to fill out the details of that scene. It can be an imaginary scene. The temperature. The colors, the smells. A 
feeling of not needing or wanting to be anywhere else in the world. And as you connect with the felt sense of contentment, perhaps in your body or in your mind, allow yourself to sink more fully into the here and now. Softening deepening into the center of time. Finding that place between wanting and ill will. where this moment is good enough. valuing this moment. Bowing to this moment. This humble moment, which is all you have. And from time to time, you may sense the winds of wanting, the restless desire, trying to blow the mind away. This is just old karma. There's no need to respond. Allow it to burn out in its own time. As the mind gently settles back into this moment, a 
settling, softening, deepening into now. And as the mind deepens in contentment, it tends to stay with whatever's simple. The simplicity of a single breath. And the mind becomes so soft that the breath just soaks right into the mind. The breath too is old karma. There's nothing you need to do. Just staying still, calm and content. As the breath relaxes the mind.
savoring each breath. You notice how satisfying the breath can be for the mind. has the taste of Nibbana, the taste of stillness. So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Just lingering with a few more breaths. I'd like to end with a few words from the Buddha describing Nibbana for your inspiration. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is the stilling of all formations, the relinquishment of all attachments the destruction of craving, dispassion or fading away, cessation, Nibbana. Little by little, as we still the doer, still the watcher, we're getting a taste for what Nibbana really means. Absolute contentment, freedom from desire. This is the peaceful, this is the sublime, that is the stilling of all formations, the relinquishment of all attachments, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, Nibbana. So, I invite you to gently open your eyes if you wish. 
continuing to savor any peace, any contentment that has grown in the mind. Okay, so <laughs> this is the last Q&A session, but tomorrow after um, Ajahn Brahm's afternoon session, I will do a bonus hour for everybody so that we can have some discussion and also you can meet each other in small groups. I'll explain that tomorrow. So if your question's not answered tonight, don't worry. By tomorrow, you'll have something different anyway. <laughs> but we will have a little bit more time to, to go over any last bits. So again, please send them in to Anne-Marie. And if those who have asked a lot of questions already this retreat would perhaps, unless it's absolutely essential, leave the space for others we'll see what we can get through we probably can get through them more than i think but i will prioritize those who haven't asked many questions okay I don't know if some of you've had to have a break, but um, I think we can go for it. It'll all be on the recording. Okay. So someone's asking, after a long period of intensive practice some years ago, I became very sensitive, easily overwhelmed, and also very forgetful. I had the impression of not functioning in the world properly anymore. And this is a problem for me in order to find work again. One teacher supposed I was practicing too much samatha or did something wrong. I stopped meditating for years in order to function normally again, but the high sensitivity and forgetfulness only recovered a little bit. Do you have a suggestion on how to deal with high sensitivity and forgetfulness? Will this change when progressing in meditation? Hmm. So there's quite a few things there. Um, some things that I really relate to and some things that I have experienced to a degree, um, but never for an extended period of time. And I would suspect that one of the reasons I haven't experienced that high sensitivity and prolonged sort of slowing down and forgetfulness as you describe and feeling easily overwhelmed, I think is because I always balanced my deep practice with a lot of service. And I think that is really helpful. So what might have happened here is that perhaps you went into that long period of intensive practice. I mean, I don't know, but maybe we can talk about it more tomorrow or another time, but um, it could be that you weren't quite ready for that or you didn't have enough experience in going in and out of long retreats. And just like with anything, you know, especially with the way that Ajahn Brahm and I've also come to teach, gentleness is really key because the mind is a very very sensitive thing <laughs> I was going to say instrument but it's it's not even an instrument really it's a, a phenomena let's say and even when I start my rains retreat now I don't go straight into 10 hours practice a day I go in gradually so maybe five or six and I'm used to doing a lot of meditation but still I enter in gradually and I come out a good week or so before the end of a retreat. So I start to integrate it bit by bit and start to just introduce other activities, you know, like a couple of hours of email, even that was like way too much after three months retreat. <laughs> but actually I had to go a little bit too fast because I had this retreat to prepare. So it was quite painful and that can happen, you know, that the transition period is, is tricky. Um, it does make me question the way that we practice these days in the West in these intensive situations, because I actually 
don't think that the Buddha necessarily encouraged it in the suttas. Like he spoke a lot about the gradual training and about how to work with the mind in daily life, how to develop a really strong foundation of what he calls charita sila. I think that's what it's called in the commentaries, the positive aspects of sila. So really developing a lot of inner happiness through virtue and a lot of skill in how to use and relate to external sense objects with our mind. And he does, does this for a reason. And only when somebody already has that inner resource and quite a lot of happiness and quite a lot of hindrances, sort of at least coarse hindrances overcome, then he says one goes to the forest and sits down cross-legged in an empty place or in a, um, under a tree. Um, and then one starts to practice the Satipatthana or the Anapana, right? One and the same. So it sounds to me like, yes, you went in perhaps too quickly and perhaps it was very intense and you didn't have enough guidance on how to come out. This could have been the thing. So it's not so much that you did something wrong. I think it's more likely you didn't get very good guidance or preparation or help with the transition. Um, and I would think that this should probably over time improve. High sensitivity is a trait. I've been reading about this a lot because I am like a classic highly sensitive person. And for me, it's a relief to find out that such a thing exists because I tick off pretty much 100, 100% of those traits, almost 100% of those traits. And it explains why I've always been told that I'm too sensitive, overreactive, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually a way that you're wired. It's, they say that highly sensitive people in the past were the intuitives, they were the medics, they were the healers of any particular tribe because they intuit things that other people don't even know about long before other people become aware of them. And this happens to me all the time. And I'm not saying this is a wonderful quality, it's not always easy to hold, but it is a, an, again, like everything, it's a condition thing and it's a pattern of behaviors, a, a, tendon, a pattern of tendencies that can help us work compassionately with ourselves. So it might even be helpful to look at, to read up about that a bit and because they have lots of techniques, ways to calm down a kind of overcharged nervous system, for example, by particular breathing methods, just to calm you down initially, or ways to kind of surround yourself like in a bubble of light. Ajahn Brown sometimes talks about that. I mean, for him, once you have really, really deep samadhi, you have that sort of protective field. And for me, it's really helpful to do a lot of metta, especially metta to myself, because that just softens the impact of lots of sense input, which I'm very sensitive to. And I get really tired if I'm, you know, busy all the time, um, just because I'm processing more than most people. So I would say you might have to make some life child changes as well. It might mean, I mean, what's normal anyway? You're saying to function normally again, but I think most of the society is functioning on overdrive. So it may be that you could look for a work or a career or a lifestyle that is gentler. They say for highly sensitive people, especially highly sensitive extroverts, which I am, which is even more rare, <laughs> um, that our ideal is a quiet community because we like people, but we also need a lot of time alone. So maybe that could work for you, a quiet community. Um, so just experiment and value the way you are, you know, don't, um, what's the word, uh, what's the word when you put somebody down, I forget now, uh, mm, stigmatize yourself, don't stigmatize yourself, because you are the way you are, and you're beautiful the way you are, so it might just be that you know, you needed to come out more gently. So hopefully this retreat will help with that a little bit. And I also think unscheduled retreats are really helpful because on unscheduled retreats, you can go with your own natural bodily rhythms and mental rhythms. So that's for me, fantastic. Okay, I hope that helps a bit. Yesterday, Ajahn Brown said that the path to jhanas is an emotional journey. Does it make sense to say that building a solid foundation in the Brahma Viharas as a cultivation of wholesome emotions makes the path to jhana easier? I would say definitely. I mean, for me, it's just incredibly helpful. As I said, sometimes I do loads and loads of metta on just a regular retreat. 
um, you know, for half my sitting sometimes. And by the time I'm with the breath, I mean, there's just so much well-being already, so much feeling of being resourced already. And yes, a familiarity with beautiful, pleasant emotions. For me, it's also helpful because Grama Viharas are not about oneself so much. They're very much about giving as well. So you can, of course, practice it to yourself, which is also really great for me. But sometimes I'm the kind of person that needs to feel I'm also giving. So if I do a lot of metaphor, say a love person in retreat, it gives me more motivation to practice because I feel like I'm also serving at the same time. And it's also, it's reducing the sense of self because you're, you're giving, right? So it's that movement of the mind, the thrust of the whole path, which is one of generosity, giving, giving up, giving away. So it really is in line with the whole idea of letting go. You know, or you can just give the meditation over to the Buddha, like you give it out of love, out of trust, out of respect for the Buddha. You just, it's a way of worshipping the Buddha. You just mentally kind of give that over. So you can add lots and lots of kindness also into the approach to meditation. But I, I do think everyone should practice. I shouldn't say should really, but <laughs> yeah. I, I just think metta is such an important part of practice and it really helps um, to undermine spiritual materialism, this idea that I want to practice for me and for my own liberation. It helps you remember, you can do it at the end of a sitting. You know, I dedicate this sitting, any peace, any harmony that I've developed, I dedicate it for the benefit of all beings. You know, I share, I share this kindness. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. Actually, I meant to do that tonight. I meant to end like that. But we will do metta tomorrow again. Um, I usually end every meditation like that. I just spend a few minutes spreading metta. And this is also a tribute to my first teacher, Esen Goenka, because that was the practice. You didn't do so much metta during the Vipassana retreat, but he always said in your daily practice, end every session with loving kindness. And it starts to sink into the mind, you know. Again, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, is it that one? Or Dweda Vitaka Sutta, I think, Majima 19, says that whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. So the more that you're familiarizing yourself with these wholesome ways of thinking, the more they just start to become like a pattern. Remember, the mind is malleable. So you can literally create and mold your mind whichever way you wish. Mm -hmm. of course gently you're not kind of forcing your mind into a particular shape that doesn't feel appropriate or doesn't fit but I think just to pop in a phrase every so often in your daily life you know can be quite nice sometimes you just need to make the intention and you'll find it happens so I hope that helps um Ajahn Brown has a lot of metta and loving kindness and I'm not sure <sighs> How much he did in the beginning because they didn't teach it that much in what Papong. But the thing is, he was always a very giving person. That's my understanding, anyway. And he had very deep meditation, even as a lay person. So he would have already had a lot of natural Brahma Viharas arising. But certainly, even for him, even though he doesn't have really, I mean, I've never seen any ill will in him. Who knows? Um, even so, when he adds loving kindness to something like the breath, it takes his meditation into a deeper, more powerful level. So it's a very powerful way of practice. And also when you practice all four Brahma Viharas, you're getting familiar with different kinds of um, emotional fields and different ways of, I mean, I think of the Brahma Viharas as four different ways that love relates to the world. So it's like metta relates to beings who are, you know, just general beings, all beings, not necessarily suffering or happy, just all beings. Compassion is like what happens when love meets suffering. And then the joy, the sympathetic joy is what happens when love meets happiness, when love meets good fortune, good qualities. Yeah. And then in a way, equanimity is what happens when love just meets the reality that you know, there is going to be suffering and has that perspective on arising and passing that everything arises due to causes and it will also come to cessation. So there's this sense of like being able to stand back and understand all that. 
and hold it in a in a very um, spacious way. So I think some familiarity with the emotional uh, world is up. And I've met meditators who've never really cultivated the Brahma Viharas and just gone straight for equanimity. And the equanimity is lacking. It's very brittle. It's almost like they're trying to be equanimous. It's like, let's try not to react, you know. I mustn't react. I mustn't react with aversion. I'll sit here no matter what. But of course, the mind's much stronger than your will. So of course, it will be reacting. <laughs> but when you practice these Brahma Viharas, you are actually developing the wholesome qualities and it's part of right effort, right endeavor. Yeah the sixth factor of the path. So we have to do that. Okay. Following a deep meditation, it feels like it takes me some time to come back and reconnect with my senses again to the point where instructions towards the end can jolt me and create a sudden shock and nausea. Is this normal? And do you have any advice on how to manage this? Firstly, just to answer the is that normal, because a lot of people are saying is that normal about their experiences. And I would really just like to give you the confidence to accept what happens and, and um, consider it normal because that's what's happening for you. So it's normal. So, so don't worry about things like this, but more look at sort of how you can try to work with them. So if that's the case, I mean, it sounds to me like you have been in a deep meditation. And these meditations that we're doing together as a group are quite short. So to me, it sounds as though you could, you would probably benefit from sitting quite a bit longer because your mind wasn't naturally ready to come out. So yeah, if the instructions are actually jolting you, that suggests that you even perhaps are turning off the sense of sound, which is wonderful. And unless you really have to come out, um, then I guess in daily life, you don't need to end with any instructions. What you could do instead is program your mind in the beginning to sort of say to yourself, okay, well, I have an hour. I will come out after an hour. I will come out after an hour. I will come out after an hour. And then, you know, see what happens or have some kind of very um, nice ringtone. I'm not sure about technical stuff not an alarm <laughs> but something very gentle to gently bring you out um the sudden shock and nausea i mean really it's just a, about making peace with that as well um yeah perhaps not opening your eyes so quickly you know, and if you know to expect the shock and nausea because it's happened before, you might just find ways of staying more centered in your body and sort of in a way feeling it before it even arises so that you can kind of relate to it in a very gentle and kind way. So I would just say sort of be gentle with coming out and maybe sit for longer. Hmm. Okay, once meditation is over, I usually feel so relaxed. I'm very sleepy afterwards. I literally go to sleep many times. I'm new at this, any advice? That's okay, that's fine. As Ajahn bam has been saying, you know, just if you're sleepy, allow yourself to sleep. Yeah, over time it changes. I mean, over time, once you get used to the meditation, you go through the sleepy phase, but then you'll pick up again afterwards and the mind will sort of reach a very nice point where it's it's just calm, but it's not sleepy. But with this particular kind of Samatha meditation, sleepiness is uh, quite common. But I know people, I mean, there's a, there was a monk in Bodhinyana in Perth, and he often used to get a lot of sloth and torpor, and it was when he emerged from that that he'd actually get into deep meditation. So it's it's kind of interesting. But the mind can emerge and be in a nice balanced state. I think in most people's cases, we are just tired. We're like chronically tired and we need more sleep than we realize. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. And if you can continue to meditate after this retreat, you'll find that every session is different. You might not get so sleepy because you won't be so calm anyway. You might just find that you, you know, the meditation helps you to come out of agitation and just 
gently settles your energy rather than sleepiness. If you're on a really long retreat, I mean, it's different because you can go through things for weeks sometimes and there's a lot of time to see what happens next. But on a shorter retreat, I mean, all these, anything that arises in a, is a great opportunity to learn. It's just a great opportunity to learn how to work with it in a kind way that's more interested, not in overcoming it, but just in understanding sleepiness and its causes. Get to know it, get to feel it. And with that kind of curiosity also, you'll find that the mind is still maintaining some awareness. Okay. I wonder if this period of practice will help me stop before getting irritated at other people's behavior or pro process the irritation so that it doesn't trigger obsessive thinking or labeling people so they almost become only their negative traits for me. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question to ask because obviously this is one of the benefits we'd all like to see that we'll stop getting irritated so much. Um, I would say that definitely this starts to happen over time, but it's not all at once. And the thing is, sometimes we can get disheartened because we see, you know, that we come out of a retreat and we're nice and peaceful. And then the first person you see kind of triggers something and you think, oh, no, I reacted exactly the same way as usual. And that's most probable. But what you also need to look out for is the times that you don't react that way, because it may be that like four times out of five times you react the same way, but the fifth time which you would have acted, you don't. So you might start to find that the time, the amount of times that you react that way start to lessen. And there are times you don't react that way. And also you'll probably find that you might get irritated, but it might not last as long or it might not be as intense as it used to be. So be very kind to yourself. Don't expect miracles, especially if this is your first retreat. Um, but over a period of time, and certainly through the daily life practice, which has to happen, you know, if you don't have your daily life practice, then the benefits start to fade. Again, you know, the mind is a conditioned thing. So if your conditioning now suddenly just goes back into the usual conditioning, then the effects of this conditioning of the last seven days will fade. So this regular practice is really important. And even when you find you're getting irritated, you can take yourself away from that situation and maybe, you know, practice before that comes to the surface. Personally, for me, in my practice, the practice of being very, very connected to my body sensations was incredibly helpful in this more in a sense than the Samatha practice, because what we would do by scanning through the body time and again is notice very, very subtle sensations in the body that would arise alongside things like irritation. And they would arise sometimes even before the irritation was fully manifest. So you started to notice those feelings arising before they had chance to lead into a reaction in speech or bodily action and the other beautiful thing about it was that we were taught to notice how these sensations are constantly changing and constantly dissolving actually and passing away so even as the irritation or the anger would be arising you would feel it like really not a solid thing you'd feel it like something that was just like waves that were just kind of moving around and and they didn't seem like they could have the same amount of control over you it was almost like, what's the point reacting to something if it's just arising and passing anyway? It's like the mind doesn't have enough to grasp onto to react to. So that I find really helpful. And I would say that that's where mindfulness of the body in daily life can really come in helpful. You know, stay, staying embodied, staying centered in your physical experience and starting to notice if that kind of feeling starts to arise you know and then you can address the feeling make peace with the feeling rather than blame the trigger so that would be one thing the other thing I guess that can start to happen is that you start to realize that that obsessive thinking and labeling people really causes you a lot of suffering you know, because you've already got the awareness that you're creating them into that negative um, person who is only negative traits in your eyes. So you're already seeing that that's distorted and you're questioning your thoughts, right? So you're not buying into your thoughts as much as you were. So this is good. 
And then you'll start to see that that obsessive thinking creates you suffering and you'll become repelled from that. You know, it's like when you pick up hot coal after a while, you just get so burned, you're fed up with that. You know, maybe before you thought there was some kind of kick to that, it gave you a sense of self. But after a while, you'll see that it's a very coarse and, and um, state of suffering and you'll feel that you want to turn away. So yeah, that's for you to find out. And I would say that meditation will definitely help with that if you continue the practice in the long term. So yeah, mark up your successes and don't worry too much about when you fail because you would have failed anyway, fail, so-called, right? You would have got irritated with this person or this situation anyway. So every time you don't is a bonus. Okay, I love this idea of gradual training. I don't seem to have read any books or reading currently that emphasize this with the beautiful clarity and groundedness that you talk about this with. Any advice on this and how to incline towards this would be helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really true actually that um, not many contemporary books on Buddhism or even on psychotherapy or any sort of spirituality talks about the gradual training. And it is definitely a term coined by the Buddha um, in the texts. And they actually come up, like suttas on the gradual training come up something like 40 times in the Pali Canon. So it's, it's one of the main thrusts of the teaching. And yet it seems that, you know, scholars of Buddhism and maybe depending on the country of origin where Buddhism is taught, have focused in on the Satipatthana Sutta over and above pretty much everything else. There's only about four places, I think, where the Satipatthana Sutta is taught. And yet there's about 10 times more places where the gradual training is taught. And the Satipatthana comes as part of that, right? Sometimes they go from um, undermining the hindrances through sense restraint into the practice of the four Satipatthanas. Sometimes they go from that into the jhana practice. Again, it's two seemingly different paths to one and the same. Slight different emphasis sometimes, depending on how you've been taught. Um, so it's wonderful to have a context because I think what most of us are missing, especially Westerners who haven't had a Buddhist um, upbringing, what most of us are missing is this idea of um, how to apply the teachings in daily life. And for many of us, we've come into contact with the teachings through an intensive retreat setting, which, you know, you can go into whether or not you've done the preparation. So it's like, because of the retreat setting, you observe your sila, right? Because there's no chance to break your sila. But it's an artificial environment. You might not have actually developed the muscles of the mind to observe that sila, that virtue in daily life. So when you come out again, you're kind of lost because you pulled in the same ways that you used to be and the foundation can get destroyed. So I would say, try to get into the suttas. And also because the suttas are kind of bare boned about it to a degree, um, well, I can recommend one sutta straight away, Majjhima Nikaya 51, and there's also the one, mm, what's that? I don't know off the top of my head, there's another really nice one on the gradual training, uh, which I forget, but you'll start to recognize it as a format in the suttas. There's a lot in the Digha Nikaya as well, the long discourses of the Buddha. And then the other thing I would really recommend is to listen to some teachings of Ajahn Brahmali, who is Ajahn Brahm's senior most bhikkhu disciple. Um, so he's like the uh, deputy abbot at Ajahn Brahm's monastery. And Ajahn Brahm used to teach quite a bit on the gradual training, but in a sort of generalized way. But Ajahn Brahmali obviously was somebody who really took to that and cultivated the foundations very deeply. And he's drawn it out in enormous detail in his teachings and his retreats. Um, we're having a retreat actually with Ajahn Brahmali online in, <laughs> it's kind of a secret, so please don't write to us about it because the reason I keep it quiet is because we don't want emails, but we're having one anyway in May. <laughs> so if you sign up for our newsletter, you can come to his retreat, but he goes through the gradual training in great, great detail. And it's always helpful, you know, to have people who are living this and who can speak about it from their own experience and draw out what's in the suttas. It's like the suttas give you kind of like a little gem and he sort of spreads it out and creates this beautiful mosaic where you can see all how it goes together and how to come at it from different angles. 
So, yeah, but just to go through it in very brief, okay? So it starts usually with having some kind of right view, at least the idea that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. This is Majjhima 51. Um, and then because of that, one has the right motivation to practice. Then one hears the teachings, okay? So you have to hear the teachings. This is really number one step. If you don't hear the teachings, what can you do? Then you develop confidence in those teachings. And with that confidence, you start to feel motivated to start practicing sila because you realize that your body, your, the, your intentions, your actions of body, speech, and mind have consequences for yourself and for others. So there's a motivation to start purifying your virtue to bring about more happiness in life. And you know, this particular sort of talks about all the positive aspects of the precepts. And then it talks about sense restraint, which is another kind of virtue. It's when we start looking at the virtue of the mind. So are we developing defilements, developing negativities in the mind, not only in body and speech, right? So are we thinking on wholesome thoughts? Are we developing anger when we could be developing compassion? And we start to, combine that with mindfulness and that starts to affect our daily life we can also learn to reframe our experience in more positive ways so instead of thinking oh it's so unfortunate that I'm here alone for the whole rains retreat oh I should have been in Perth with Ajahn Brown what a thought that came to my mind was imagine 11 years ago when I first heard Ajahn Brown's talks imagine if somebody would have said that 11 years later You'd be in your own little bikuni place. You'd be a close disciple of Ajahn Brown working with him to develop a monastery in England. I just wouldn't have believed it, you know. I just wouldn't. <laughs> and I completely reframed it. And I just felt like, wow, this is amazing. You know, having personal interviews with my teacher, who at that time was just a little voice on a recording that I was listening to in sweaty Burma <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. So it completely reframed it in a way that brought a lot of joy and gratitude and inspiration. So this is the general thing with the gradual training. And from there, we're on, already undermined a lot of hindrances so that when we then go to solitude, into solitude, we're starting with mindfulness already quite strong. Yeah, we've already restrained the hindrances. We haven't abandoned them, but we've restrained them enough to go into solitude and to sit cross-legged and start to observe the breath, yeah? And then we can go either into the jhanas or some suttas talk about going into the satipatthanas, some suttas talk about going into the loving kindness jhanas, yeah? And as a result of that, um, we're able to develop the wisdom into how things really are, to the yata bhuta jnana dasana, the truth of the way things really are, which means, you know, the truths of impermanence, non-self and suffering, essentially. So I would say read the suttas and as you get the framework, if you can sort of take what I just said as the kind of big framework, you start to be able to read other suttas and put chunks of them into those particular slots in that framework. So each particular part gets filled out. Yeah. So there's a sort of sequence to it all. And it also aligns with the Eightfold Path. So it becomes very fascinating, that's what I can say. And I can really say thank you to Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali both for helping it all sort of come together for me. Not that I fully understand it. Okay. So this person saying they've loved their time on this retreat and got a lot of peace, but today has been taken over by a mental obsession with someone who's hurt me deeply and broken my trust. I'm getting so close to letting go, but then the anger comes back. I've put so much loving kindness their way to counteract this, but always come back to the hurt, mainly as they were acting as though nothing happened. In every other way, I'm being so strong about big changes in my life and all other relationships are better than they ever have been. I have so much gratitude for that. That's absolutely wonderful. And I think that it sounds to me like you're the one in need of your own compassion here because you're trying so hard to give this other person loving kindness and yet you keep coming back to your hurt. That means you're not staying with your hurt long enough to heal it. 
sometimes it's so tempting to think, oh, you know, the faults in me, I should develop loving kindness to this person, I mustn't be angry. And we bypass our own pain, you know, and at this time, maybe the best thing to do is actually look inside and, and say, oh, I'm hurting, you know, there's anger here, I need my own care and compassion. So this is a particular time I think that it's important to, because I said before that we don't have to start with ourselves. but in this case, if the hurt keeps coming up, then you are the one that's most in need of your own loving care. So I think this would be helpful. And then when that heals, you may find that you're able to relate to this other person in a more balanced way, but please don't push yourself. You know, it sounds like you've been almost trying too hard. And with loving kindness, it also takes time to develop. Remember, we're giving love not to, um, not with an agenda, not even the agenda of overcoming anger. We just give the love and we trust that in time it will wear that anger away. We know which direction it's going in, but we can't make it happen faster than it will. It will work and it does work, but give it time, go gently. And I would say, give yourself a lot of compassion. Don't blame yourself for feeling angry if someone's broken your trust. It can also teach you the importance of trust, isn't it? Sometimes when people do things like that to us and break our trust, I mean, it helps us to make a determination that we'll never break someone else's trust because we know the suffering of it, you know? And to me, that helps as well with, um, with accepting the suffering because I know that if I'm able to um, make peace with the suffering and understand the suffering, I'll develop more empathy through that towards someone else who's been hurt in a similar way so that suffering won't go waste you know it's not a mistake it's not something you need to push out of your life it may make you a very trustworthy person in future and sometimes it makes us more careful about our friends or our partners you know because we do need to rely on people we want to be around people we can trust so so don't go too hard on yourself okay <clears throat> Gosh, we're almost out of time. I'm just going to quickly see. Okay, I think I can do those too. Would love to hear your thoughts on the fifth precept, especially on not taking alcohol to excess. I'm in France and here people drink a glass or two of wine or champagne and it's associated with the good life. Are there any instances where drinking alcohol is okay if one is careful not to go overboard? <laughs> um, not in Buddhism. <laughs> I mean, there might be instances where it's okay in your life if you're okay with not being on five precepts, but it's not in line with the five precepts. That's the thing. So it's a bit like what Ajahn Brown said when you said the good life there. You know, um, the good life is actually often a life of virtue. It's just that we haven't learned to define it that way. Um, what I notice or what I can kind of infer from the drinking culture in England is that actually a lot of people don't really want to drink. They just do it because they kind of feel they should and because they think everybody else expects it. But actually, when someone just says, actually, I'm, you know, I don't want to drink wine, I'll just have some orange juice. Other people then sometimes feel permitted to do the same. It's as if nobody dare be the first person to sort of break the social norm. But if you start to find that you want to relinquish drinking wine and that you know it feels good to you to try just to see how it feels, you may well find that um, you inspire other people. And even if not, people will respect you anyway. You know, in my experience, people respect those who stay true to themselves and true to their own values. I mean, even with my parents, for example, I mean, to, for me to live this life, to just leave a small town in the north of England at 19 years old, actually 18, and just, just go, you know, to the other side of the world with like 200 quid and no return ticket and just say, see you, I'm not going to university, even though I could have got whatever degree I wanted. That was kind of a pretty big deal. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, that, that was a good thing. Actually, now I can look on it and sort of really have quite a lot of compassion for my poor parents who didn't even hear from me for at least a month. I couldn't get to a phone, you know. <laughs> but what I'm saying this for is because over the years, they've seen that my resolve and my commitment and inclination has remained completely steady. It's been, I've been unwavering 
in my devotion to the Dhamma and devotion to the path. And over time, that starts to make an impression and they start to think, what is this? This must be something. It must be something worth while. And actually, one beautiful piece of news for this retreat is that they've been watching on live stream Ajahn Brahm's meditations every morning, which is just extraordinary to me. I mean, they have done a little bit in the past, but usually just associated with wanting to come and see me and me being in a monastery. So they had to do something. But this time they've been doing it, you know, without me saying a thing. And they did it for three days running to the point where my mom said, oh, unfortunately, your dad's got an appointment on Tuesday, so he's going to miss it. <laughs> Which is just so amazing. So I said to Ajahn, it's as if you sort of somehow gained their trust. And, and, you know, even though they'd never say it, he's sort of become their teacher now. And to a degree, I think they even, I don't think they can see their daughter as a teacher, but they certainly think that I'm speaking sense. And they feel proud and they think, oh, there's some wisdom there. Sometimes I'll say something that gives something a different angle. They'll be almost like, oh, our daughter said that. <laughs> and so I guess I'm just saying that to show that when you find a path that you want to follow, please don't be afraid of that. You know, if you feel like, OK, everybody else expects it, but I want to do this. You'll have the confidence, you'll have the courage, you'll have the sincerity without being kind of proud to um to just do it and explain it and and people will come over to your side eventually that is my suspicion so experiment for yourself no one can say don't do it but there's a reason it's there and i think it's very freeing if nothing else you know of course there's a reason because of the kind of general distortion of the mind. We're trying to clarify our mind and make it as pure and bright as we possibly can. And anything we can do to help ourselves is good. Anything we can do to avoid clouding the mind is even better. Um, so that's one thing which might not be immediately obvious. But the other thing is that it gives you a lot of feeling of strength and freedom when you know you don't need to do that. So that is something you can experience straight away by giving things up. Okay, one more question, I think. In my daily life, I'm one of the more boring people where I work and then I don't really have many activities that I want to do. Oh, sounds lovely. I'm happy to do less than to do more. However, this does not really help towards my relationship as I don't do much. My career as I don't spend after time work to do training, etc. I have a tiny fear that meditation might make me lose even more. Do you have any opinion on this? Thank you very much. Well, the words that are jumping out at me in your question are the words, I'm happy to do less than more. So it seems to me like your fears are more based around what other people might think and whether or not you'll progress in the world in the way other people might expect. And perhaps whether your relationships will suffer, which of course may affect your happiness. But it sounds to me like this is a kind of lessening of desire and that you're actually quite content without being, you know, embroiled in the rat race. So it sounds to me OK. And when you said I'm one of the more boring people, I thought, hmm, according to who, actually? I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm pretty boring, too. You know, I don't really do anything apart from what I'm doing with teaching. I mean, that's something. But... Otherwise, if I'm left to myself, I'll be just, you know, like on a retreat, I wake up, I do a bit of exercise, I have my food, then I sit all day. <laughs> then after lunch, I have a little rest and then I sit all day again. Um, and then I listen to a talk and that's it. And then I go to bed and it's the same. It was the same for three months. So most people would say that was really boring, <laughs> um, but actually I loved it. So I don't really mind what people say. I'm not bored with myself. In fact, I wish I was a bit more boring on, in the head because um, my mind can be quite, you know, imaginative. I wish it was a bit less talkative. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I wouldn't be too worried because along with the meditation, even though you might have less craving and less desire, you will, you will be developing kindness. You will be developing empathy and compassion. So I don't really think it's going to adversely affect your relationship. I think you're going to be a caring person to those around you. Mm. 
And again, you'll be surprised. A lot of people would like to have a quieter life, but again, they feel kind of socially compelled to go out and do whatever you're meant to do. But now you've got the best excuse because it's COVID time anyway. You can't do very much at all. And I wonder how society is going to look later. We might all have got used to doing quite a bit less, you know. A lot of us, I think, are realising that there were things we were doing that we that were actually draining us. And do. So, yeah, I don't think you should worry about that. As Adrian Brown would say, be a loser and get lost. <laughs> it's a bit weird, isn't it? He says that in the front of one of his books. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> This may you all get lost in the introduction. There was one more question and I'm wondering if we can do one more. We're only three minutes over time. And if we can do this other one, then I'll feel very happy because we have done everyone's. Okay. How can I gently deal with conceit that arises in the mind? Thank you. Um, I don't think there's a lot you can do about that because conceit is present even f until you're um, fully enlightened, actually. So there are these subtle conceits that even an anagami has, which are the conceit that I am better, worse or the same. So there's still some kind of conceiving in terms of an I, even though at that point they know that there's no self there's no real entity in there that can be measured so it's such a, a sort of ingrained part of who we think we are you know this comparison this measuring this judging in relation to something else that it's kind of hard to overcome I think the word gently is good here because you said how can I gently deal with it and that's how to deal with it gently <laughs> you know okay conceit is arising oh there you go it's understandable you know of course I'm bound to have conceit but you know mind it's not really helpful to you don't believe in it too much that's one of the things that I like very much when you sort of realize that everything's conditioned you still have the thoughts but you just don't believe in them as much you just kind of doubt their validity so you can still have thoughts sometimes which are quite adamant about someone or something I mean, I have them all the time. I think, what on earth am I doing? You know, I shouldn't be doing this. I was supposed to have a simple life and be in Asia and meditating all day, every day. And it's like they come again and again. And I just have to say, OK, thoughts, there you are. But I'm not going to change what I'm doing anyway, because this is kind of it's kind of on its own momentum at this point when you renounce. I was going to tell the story earlier, actually, about um, what happened after I was traveling around India free as a bird. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to ordain was because I realized that even though I was very free in many ways, I still had a lot of say about where I'd go and when. You know, I'd still kind of decide, okay, now it's the monsoon season, I'll go up to Ladakh. Or now it's kind of hot in the south, I'll go up into the Himalayas. You know, or now it's the snow in the Himalayas, it's time to go to Nepal or to Thailand or you know whatever and I realized that although I was developing a lot of equanimity and a lot of contentment with many many things I was still able to influence it quite a lot and move out of situations that were difficult and at some point I'm not saying we should make things hard for ourselves at all but at some point I realized that I needed a, a deeper um, challenge in a way like I wanted to learn what it was like to just stay put just to say, okay, I'm going to renounce, I'm going to give my life to the Dhamma now and see where it leads me and have staying power, you know, go to Burma, be with my teacher. And as far as I was concerned, I was staying there for life. That was the feeling I had. And the relief of that after how many years, like, ooh, about 12 years of traveling in Asia, it was immense, you know, the relief was immense just to feel I finally arrived. I don't have to go anywhere. But unfortunately, my life had other plans and I got sick and I actually really was physically forced to leave. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, I came into contact with Ajahn Brown right before I left. And now things have taken a different course. And I think part of the renunciation is just recognizing that you are far less in control. And that life asks certain things of you, especially as a monastic. And there's not a lot of choice. 
you know we don't have choice around money and food and all these sort of normal things that lay people have and you 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 sort of give yourself to the training and for me it's helpful also to have a teacher who can guide so I did actually literally say to Ajahn Brahm probably verbally but certainly mentally that he can do what he wants with me and so he did <laughs> so the, it's like there's this little ego inside that sometimes kicks off about it and says ah, I'm not sure about this I'm not sure about this and then there's this bigger kind of ah just go with it you know again coming back to those three right intentions and just make peace be kind be gentle trust in the purpose of what I'm doing and of course, you know, we discuss things. And if I say I need a break, then I'll have a break. You know, it's not again this complacency or a lack of any um, any agency at all. I can't remember now why I went into that, but it was sort of related. <laughs> but anyway, it was related to the topic of contentment. So that was something I wanted to share. Great. <laughs> so oh somebody has put one more message in and i'll try to do it because you asked so humbly um what is the wisest way to engage and help with wider so social challenges so that's a massive question and maybe ajahn brown could address it tomorrow but i don't think we can say there's a wisest way to engage and help with wider social challenges you know all of my life i've been asking that question what is the why am i here what is the meaning of my life and how can i best bring compassion into this world and the only thing i could think <laughs> surprise surprise is to try and end samsara for myself and to show others how to end samsara too there are other people who feel that there's nothing they can do as long as the climate crisis is unaddressed and that if they don't do that, nothing else makes sense. There are other people who feel that, you know, they cannot tolerate child abuse and they want to work with that. There are other people who feel they want to work with, I don't know, survivors of torture and trauma, or they want to work as psychotherapists. We can't do everything. So I think really it's about where your strengths are and what, you, what sort of opportunities come your way as well, and what seems most pertinent to you. And just, you know, be satisfied with doing a little. I just want to quote Mother Teresa, because I think what she says is so beautiful. She says, we're not asked to do great things. We're asked to do small things with great love. And I just think that's so wonderful because it's much more realistic and it's very humble. And again, if we can be contented with whatever we can do, you know, however small or insignificant that might feel, then we can really be satisfied that we've had a beneficial life, a good life, and you'll die feeling happy that you contributed some love, some kindness into this world. That's enough, you know, that's amazing. That's not just enough, that's amazing, yeah. Considering the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion within us, that's an amazing thing. So don't set the standard too high and uh, let the question percolate as well. Yeah. It can change throughout your life. So. And also just to end this session, to reflect at the end of every day on whatever goodness, kindness, service you've done for others, reflect on that. It's not about pride, it's about encouraging the mind. Yeah. Good. So I think that's all for me for this evening. And thank you so much because that's the last time I'll be formally addressing the group. But we will have a session together tomorrow from about two till three. So I'm hoping to see most of you there. And um, we'll have some live questions. So you'll be able to ask yourself. None of it will be recorded. It will be just an informal session. So I'm looking forward to that at the end of tomorrow and that will help you take a step out of the retreat okay so good night everybody lots of meta to you all